Hello. Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. This is episode 16. We are currently reading Have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mamiya Abu Jamal. Let's continue. Black lives don't matter. And neither does video. December 12th, 2016. The trial of the killer cop who shot an unarmed black man, Walter Scott, is off. Hung jury. If the videotape killing of Scott wasn't shock enough, the hung jury certainly suffices. The images are, to say the least, chilling. Mr. Scott is seen fleeing in terror from a calm, younger white man. The runner appears to be one unaccustomed to running easily, yet he is running, running away from the calm-faced white man wearing a dark uniform. As Mr. Scott runs, the calm white man pulls out a weapon, aims, and pulls the trigger, 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 pulls the trigger. Eight bullets fly. Mr. Scott clad in a bright green shirt, crumples to the green earth and breathes his last breath. The white cop calmly bends over and picks up a dark object with wires hanging from it, walks back to the body and drops the object nearby. The cop looks as if he's strolling on a beach in the Bahamas with not a care in the world. But the video, apparently, wasn't enough, at least not, at least not to one of the jurors who refused to convict ex-cop Michael Slager despite the overwhelming evidence against him. The murder of Mr. Walter Scott, documented on videotape for all to see, proves, if proof were needed, that black lives don't matter, at least for that jury. And guess what? Apparently, videotape doesn't matter when a black person gets killed by a white cop. Remember when MOVE member Delbert Africa, unarmed, his upper body bare, was beaten, punched, kicked, and stumped by several Philadelphia cops? A white judge dismissed the video evidence of his beating and acquitted the three cops. LAPD's heinous beating of Rodney King, also on tape, remember? A predominantly white jury ignored the video and acquitted the cops. The Black Lives Matter movement was called into existence and has so much work to do because, well... Black lives still don't matter. Uh, and I have heard about this case before, uh, that they're speaking of the of Walter Scott. Excuse me. Uh, I, I believe the first time I heard about this case also was in the book of the book, The End of Policing, which does a very good job of of highlighting some of these sp- macro aggressions of police terrorism and tracing root causes of them. I think the the this this passage paints to two or paints a picture of me of two things. One of them is just the violent nature of policing, the the normal normal normalization of the violence and the normalization of the corruptness that this officer that was that ended up being caught filmed doing this uh, without any type of uh, worry or concern of what may happen if he is caught planting this taser. He just goes and plants the taser. He shoots the he shoots the man running away from him. And that's the story for so many people. Tyrus Jones in Rockford, Illinois, shot while running away. Jose Gonzalez Jr. in Rockford, Illinois, shot while running away. Uh, and then I think the other thing is the fact that, again, we've seen here that it was video of Faustin Guaitigo being murdered inside of his home by Winnebago County Sheriff deputies, and it did not move the needle. It did not get people out of their seats and onto the streets. And, it, and so we have to do the work of making sure that our humanity and our empathy is not less advanced than our technology. And right now, that is the case, is that we have uh, the more we have these technological advances that can get us to be able to see these heinous actions in 4K, but we still have our propaganda propagandized by mainstream media to believe that these police officers can do no wrong. And so we have to change the perception of police. 
we have to change the perception of police. To protect and serve whom? Published this pamphlet in September 2015, updated February 2017. What makes a movement a movement? What social forces come together to make it cohere, to build it into something that can stand in the world like a newborn thing, able to drop, rise on unsteady legs, breathe deeply, and then run its course? Consider this. There has never been a time since the, quote, founding, end quote, of the U.S. government that there has not been a movement of some sort. But like any other thing in life, such movements have been weak or strong and ever flow, depending on the social conditions from which they emerge. We live in an era where the very notion of a movement seems strange or out of time. That may be because over the last half century, the state has worked hard to counter the influence and memory of the movements as soon as possible. The state projects itself through the institutions of media, the academy, and public schools so as to present a false, misleading historical narrative that confuses people. As a result, it becomes difficult to see a social movement grow, interact, swell, and finally, present its positions in the public square so that they cannot be easily refuted. Thanks to movement scholars, we know of the deep hatred and venomous methods that deploy, venomous methods deployed against the late Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., a man whom the U.S. government nefariously pressured to kill himself. The Reverend's greatest enemy was his own government, a force crystallized in the person of the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover, an unabashed racist, used his powers to try to destroy any movement that questioned the status quo. But Hoover seemed to reserve his deadliest assaults for members of black freedom movements. This may be perhaps best seen in the program codenamed Comatel Pro, Code speak for the counterintelligence program operated for decades by the FBI against U.S. citizens, particularly black movement leaders from Dr. King to Huey P. Newton of the Black Panthers. All were treated in the words of William Sullivan, assistant director of the FBI, while speaking to staffers of the U.S. Senate Committee Investigation Cointel Pro as enemies of the state. This is a common practice, rough, tough, dirty business. To repeat, it is a rough, tough, dirty business and dangerous. No holes were barred. We have used that technique against foreign espionage agents and they have used it against us. Questioner. The same methods were brought home? Answer. Yes, brought home against any organization against which we were targeting. We did not di differentiate. This is a rough, tough business, end quote. Nor should we forget how the FBI viewed Dr. Martin Luther King Jr against Director Sullivan's words. Quote, we regard Martin Luther King as the most dangerous Negro leader in the country. End quote. Why is this important to us now in the womb of another emerging national movement? It is vital for it teaches young activists and revolutionaries in the making that this is the real, essential nature of the state. Militant opposition to any social force that seeks to make it more open, democratic, and accountable and that threatens to increase public control over public resources, institutions, and affairs. If you begin a social movement and fail to understand this historic reality, you will march into a buzzsaw that will leave you in pieces. And then that brings us to the end of that passage. And again, this is just Mamiya Abu-Jamal speaking about uh, the importance of movement building and the way uh, that we must go about movement building for the issues that uh, we are currently facing in Rockford, Illinois, excuse me, for the issues that we are currently facing when it comes to police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice the world over. But also, again, we want to specifically be relating these to Rockford, Illinois. And I ain't going to lie, that those those two passages, I just smoked this blunt. This coffee was kind of weak, and them two passages got me a little tired. So I'm going to stop this segment, and then I'm going to pick it back up uh, in a couple hours. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Welcome back to Rockford Reading. I believe this is episode 16. We are reading Have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mamiya Abu Jamal. We're going to pick up on the bottom of page 181. The reason movements emerge. 
When a society reaches a dead end, when it can no longer persist in its old ways, social movements arise to push it to its next stage of development. If that social movement is able to project its ideas and spread them widely enough, and these ideas find room in the hearts and minds of the people, such movements may make that next step and define the era zeitgeist and what is and is not the common good. History shows us that social movements can transform society, but they do not, do, but they do not go uncontested, for the status quo of the state abhors change. The state always sees change as a challenge, and it utilizes its vast power to counteract any such change. Note well that we have been using the well-known and well-documented example of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement to proffer these ideas. On its face, such a national movement seems benign today, for in some ways it has succeeded in integrating its narrative and perspective into the nation's narrative and perspective and into the hearts and minds of people around the globe. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a national hero who is honored with a national holiday and a towering granite statue of his likeness on the mall of the nation's capital. Moreover, his visage stares out from the semi-grotted wall of the Church of England where he is recognized as a saint. If the state could do what it did against a mild-mannered minister such as Martin Luther King, what can it do to you? Answer, whatever it wants to. Activism is, neither, activism is neither easy nor necessarily safe, and that is especially so in this age where the people are exposed to an Orwellian level of internal surveillance, police militarization, and criminalization of dissent unprecedented in U.S. history. Being active in the movement to hold police accountable for their crimes against people and their communities seems only to increase exposure to such forces of intolerance. This movement for justice against police violence. It is no coincidence that the words, quote, police, end quote, and, quote, politician, end quote, are so similar, for they both derive from the same Greek term for city-state, polis. Police are employee servants of the state, and as such, the instruments of state policy. And what is the state? Marx and Engels said, quote, the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeois, end quote. Thus, Police serve the ownership and wealth classes of their societies, not the middling or impoverished people. For the latter, it is quite the reverse. That's why we see the police utilized to surveil those who organize labor, the oppressed, social movements, and networks of resistance, and why they beat down those who dare to speak out and protest. In Brazil, state authorities casually slay street children, for they are seen by shop owners and elites as a kind of public pestilence. In Iguala, Mexico, officials team up with narco traffickers and disappear dozens of students. In China, police beat down students who demand real representation in state power. In New York and across the country, cops coordinated surveillance and mass arrests in an attempt to criminalize the Occupy movement and force its supporters in their message, not just from the street, but from public view. Police, therefore, don't only perform a public anti-crime policy, in order to serve their financial and political masters, they must also commit crimes themselves, crimes that involve violence, abuse, and thwarting basic constitutional freedoms and human rights. When you look at a police car and see the motto, quote, to protect and serve, end quote, don't be fooled. If you are a person of color, an immigrant, a person of conscience ethically compelled to protest, to protest, the armed authorities may not protect and serve you. And that is especially so if you live in a low-income community, a barrio, or in the dark-skinned part of town. If you are wealthy, what the Occupy movement made infamous by calling it, quote, the 1%, end quote, then yes, they protect and serve you. What happens every day in economically disadvantaged neighborhoods of color with shock whites who live in better secure middle-class neighborhoods. For the fact is, police relate to each community in a completely different posture. Changing an institution requires knowing its origins. <clears throat> Therefore, activists committed to holding police accountable for chronic violence in our communities must know who the police really are, historically, and what social function they have performed. If activists are undereducated in this regard, or misinformed, they will not be able to see how best to approach and change the police as an institution. 
Understanding history keeps activists from accepting cheap reforms that act as institutional coverage for the growing repressive powers of the police in an era of mass surveillance and open authoritarianism. Taking the time to study and understand America's deep history is essential in order to see, anticipate, and plan for what is before us. And then a new, a new passage starts right there. Give me a second, y'all. I got to take a drink of this coffee. It's early morning. It's early in the morning. It's starting to be chilly these mornings. So I got the coffee to keep me warm and to get a little boost on the day. Uh, so let's, let's do some reflecting on the last two passages we just read. Uh, first, uh, I think the thing that sticks out to me the most from the the last passage we read through is is the the statement that we must understand the history of policing if we want to be able to properly struggle against policing. And I, I, that's something that I've implored heavily about all three of these issues that we tackle here as an organization. Police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. I don't believe that you can properly combat and struggle against any of these three things without having an intimate knowledge and intimate understanding of the history of those three things, of where those the roots of those three things and where they trace back to, uh, because at any point in which you fall short or even at any point in which you fall short in understanding the full history of any of those three issues is a vulnerability for you to be or for the movement or for your struggle or for the struggle to be exploited by these institutions that inherently understand all three of those things because even if the person that is the chief of police doesn't understand the roots and the history and the origins of police uh his police department has existed since the roots and the hist you know since the beginning of this institution in whatever area he is in and so he doesn't need to understand those things the institution that he is part of understand understands those things uh and so we have to ha be building organizations and building collectives that has that same understanding that these institutions have. Uh, and again, the same thing when you uh, with reforms, you will be fooled and tricked by reforms, especially in policing and mass incarceration. If you don't understand the history and the depths of the corruptness of uh, police terrorism and mass incarceration and the uh, the absolute necessity for us to destroy the institutions of policing that exist now, destroy this institution of mass incarceration that exists now, and, and uh, create new institutions that are equitable and just and humane, uh, and new outlets and new systems that are that are those things. I think one of the other things that stands out to me is when Mamiya Abu-Jamal uh, begins to speak about the dangers that come with activism, begins to speak about the type of police state that we live in currently in uh, the United States of America. When you think back to Ferguson, there were multiple activists who were involved in Ferguson who, as, when, as years passed, uh, wound up dead, uh, murdered, unsolved cases. Uh, the same thing has happened uh, the world out, not just in, in Rockford, Illinois, not, it's not just Rockford, Illinois, not just in America, but in other countries where people, were, people have stood up against uh, the status quo when stood up against oppression, they have been systematically murdered. They have been uh, uh, shipped shipped into prisons, and and so yes, that is true. And that goes back into the beginning of time. There there is no, there are no historical figures, and there is no historical account of people or a person struggling against oppression, struggling against against exploitation, struggling against injustice. There's no history account where the people who have waged those type of struggles were not either murdered or uh, killed or attacked or persecuted or had their uh, character, uh, their characters attempted to be assassinated. And so that is something that we also have to understand when we begin to enter into this struggle. We, we, we must do the job of informing and educating uh, our brothers and sisters and our, uh, our, our, our comrades of the things that come along with this struggle uh, and to uh, also do the job of informing and educating them why it is important that we struggle nevertheless, even though these things come along with it. And so those are all the, 
some of the first things I take away from those passages. I'm looking through here to see if there's anything else that I specifically think I should touch on. And then the reason movements emerge. I think that, again, the, the, the best pieces of literature that I have read about these issues do the job of connecting police terrorism to mass incarceration, connecting mass incarceration to to racial injustice and police terrorism to racial injustice. And then at the in, whether it's at the end or the middle or in the beginning or just throughout the piece of literature, it also does the job of explaining why we must have movement building to combat these issues of police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. What movement building looks like to combat these issues of police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. And so uh, as we are getting to the latter end of this book, we see Mami Abu-Jamal doing that same thing. And I think that that is one of the things that comes with the understanding of the history of these issues is you understand that to absolve ourselves of these issues, it must be a mass movement that is created. It must be a mass movement that is sustained. It must be something that is uh, worked on in the form of a marathon with a, a long t with long term goals, short term goals as well, but with long term goals. And uh, and so I was happy to see that Mami Abu Jamal started speaking about movement building, and I thought the things that he said about movement building were were spot on. Uh, okay, my fault, y'all. Trying to figure out where we was at. Okay. Hold on one second. All right. In the beginning, the vivid, energized eruptions of protest across some 200 U.S. cities in the wake of the monstrous grand jury decisions not to pursue criminal charges against the police who killed Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, or Eric Garner in Staten Island, New York, were not the beginnings of the movement. If anything, they were just the most visible responses of something that had been boiling and bubbling in the black American psyche for generations. Similarly, the chronic injustice itself, illicit police violence and impunity, has rankled black life in America for an equally long period of time. If we read any traditional history of American policing, we will likely encounter tales that the American system was derived from the British effort to establish the London Metropolitan Police of 1829. The assertion is an error. The assertion, this assertion is an error. Two centuries before the institution of Scotland Yard got into the game, armed, violent police forces were operating in the United States with a specific role. To keep enslaved blacks in bondage, to punish those who attempted to escape to freedom, and to deter blacks from revolting against the system that enslaves, commodifies, and terrorizes them. Originally known as, quote, slave patrols, end quote, thousands of armed British soldiers were dispatched to Barbados to form the core the core of forces used to keep Africans in complete subjugation to their white oppressors. Indeed, this was their only job. Their import from the British West Indies to the British colonies in North America, circa 1696 to 1702, marked the introduction of what were then termed, quote, militia tenants, end quote. Their job, researcher Christian Williams explains in Enemies in Blue, was to stop, interrogate, and punish any, quote, stray, end quote, Africans, that is, any black person who was not on a plantation and directly under white control. It was this racialized system that was imported from the British West Indies to their North American colonial outpost. When the British enslavers spread from Barbados to what is today South Carolina, they brought with them more than the people they damned to a life of forced labor. They brought with them an armed system of enslavement and perpetual surveillance, a feature of all Southern slavery, but one particularly intense there so as to protect the minority whites from the massive enslaved black population that outnumbered them from the earliest years. By 1860, the eve of the U.S. Civil War, South Carolina's population was 704,000 persons. Of that number, the black population was 412,320 approximately 60% of the state total.
This massive number of brutally oppressed people required the minority of whites to bolster the role of the city guard, South Carolina's early name for the slave patrol. And it demonstrated why the entire white male population was compelled to support institutional white supremacy over blacks and faced enlistment under pain of a substantial fine, some 40 shillings, for adult males. Quote, South Carolina passed laws restricting the slaves' ability to travel and trade and created the Charleston Town Watch, end quote, writes Christine, Kristen Williams. Quote, beginning in 1671, this watch consisted of the regular constables and a rotation of six citizens. It looked for any sign of trouble, fire, Indian attacks, or slave gatherings. The laws also established a militia system with every man between 16 and 60 required to serve. End quote. Slave patrols were designed not just to deter black revolt, but to suppress black solidarity through music and culture. For example, Williams writes, among the duties of this early created armed body were to, quote, prevent all caballing against Negroes by dispersing of them when drumming or playing and to search all Negro houses for arms or other offensive weapons. End quote. Armed white supremacists not Scotland Yard's Sherlock Holmes types, were the true founding fathers of America's police system. And fear of blacks and Native Americans drove whites to add the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Give me one second, y'all. I just want to make sure we still recording. Yeah, we still recording. My fault. Police, like slave owners, were given legal and customary immunity from anything done to Africans, whether enslaved or free. That, too, is a fact, one we must come to terms with. To be sure, every state was not South Carolina, nor was South Carolina every state. But it should be noted that this was an important feature of Southern society, one that centered on institutional white supremacy and enslavement of blacks to generate enormous amounts of white wealth. And given the particularly American lust for wealth, we cannot ignore that the North, not to mention the so-called border states, also had a hand in the flesh markets of slavery. In 1790, New York led all Atlantic states in the number of enslaved people held, with some 21,000 people there forced to live in bondage. That same year, Pennsylvania had about a fifth of that number, but by 1820, Pennsylvania's enslaved population had mushroomed to 30,000. This, however, was roughly a fifth of the number for the average border state, such as Maryland and Kentucky. That said, New York, the bustling economic whirlwind of the colonies and post-revolution states, had its own history in ways quite diverse from its sister states in the South. New York, during the 19th century, was home to millions of European immigrants, many of whom were fighting anti-immigrant antipathy. The anti-Irish feel, excuse me, the anti-Irish feeling of the, of the British elites carried well into the Atlantic states, and Irish folks were subjected to brutal and unrelenting prejudice in Philadelphia and New York. On the bottom economic and social rung of American society, they were not seriously regarded as white. In Noel Ignatieff's groundbreaking 1995 work, How the Irish Became White, he recounts the peculiar origins of the Philadelphia Police Department. There, Irish were involved in running battles with nativists who, deeply imbued with anti-foreigner, anti-immigrant, and anti-Catholic fervor, staged violent attacks on Irish people and even attempted to burn down their churches. Irish folk in Pennsylvania and New York responded to such provocations as people in cities have done since Rome. They banded together, established gangs, and used their numbers, their grit, and their smarts to defend their communities. They also engaged in illegal activities to hustle money and boost local influence. In the mid-19th century Philadelphia, one of the more notorious gangs, the Killers, used the local Moya, Moya Messine Hose Fire Department as a gang hangout. Its leader, a crafty Mexico War veteran named William McMullen, wanted to take the gang into politics. This era featured the rise of the so-called know-nothings, an anti-immigrant, nativist faction that commanded considerable national influence in politics during the 1850s. By 1856, however, McMullen's organizing ability, skill at stuffing ballot boxes, and intimidation of political opponents resulted in his fellow gangsters opening up the mayorship to a Democrat, Richard Vaux, 
who returned the favor. McMullen immediately offered six members of Moya Messing Hoes and also the killers jobs as cops. They were later known as, quote, Dick Vox's police, end quote, and became infamous for their epic brutality, especially against black Philadelphians. Through their public offices, they rolled back the nativists and, former, and formed a barrier against black advancement in the city of brotherly love. In many ways, today's institution of policing extends from a historical continuum that began with white supremacist slave patrols and, in cities like Philadelphia, organized gangsterism. And in those origins lie many of the defects of the present system. They remain racist. They remain conservative. And like the gangs that their grandfathers belonged to, they remain cliquish, clannish, and aggressive toward outsiders. In 1850s era Philadelphia, they didn't preserve the peace or strive for justice. They started riots. Race riots. And then that brings us to the end of that passage. Ooh, it's chilly out here. I got a, I got one glove. I'm missing a glove. And then the glove I got got two holes in a finger. So it's a little chilly. This mic cold as hell. It's metal. I need to get like a, a cover for the mic so the mic don't get so cold. Okay, sorry. That's, that's off topic. That's off topic. So with that passage, first I would say that I, I did not know about uh, the Philadelphia policing, the origins of the Philadelphia policing. I have heard before. I have not heard of the book that Mami Abu Jamal was referring to about the about Irish people becoming integrated into the social construct of white in America. But I have heard many people speak about how Italians and Irish and, and Irish and, uh, and and Jew and Jewish people. All these people who in the day and age we live in now a lot of times are white passing or are deemed to belong to the social construct of what is white people in America. It was a time in American history where they did not belong to those things, where they were not uh, as accepted into mainstream society. And one of the things that is commonly talked about is how there were if you just did it strictly off of this idea of nationality and since uh, the Africans who have been brought over here had lost the nation specifically that they were from or the tribes that they were specifically from uh, through the whitewashing of their, their cultures, there were more Africans than there were any other group. There were more black people than there was any other group. There was more black people than there was Italians. There was more black people than Irish. There was more black people than uh, British. There was more black people than... Uh, any 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 one of the, any of these specific particular groups, and so what these national people from these different nationalities did was band together and form this construct of white to take back to end, stop to no longer be the minority and to become part of the majority, to no longer be part of the marginalized and become part of the marginalizing, and and again that is something that we must understand for the historical context of racial injustice which is another one of the things we're struggling against so we can be able to part, uh, properly articulate how race is a social construct now uh, that does not mean that when you articulate how race is a social construct that it is not real and lasting effects from these social constructs that have been created that we must do the work of, of addressing and, and dealing with but it does mean that part of the the history and the roots of the issue, of, the issues of racial injustice, tie back to the creating of these social constructs. Uh, and then another one of the things that stood out to me. Give me one second. I'm looking through here. Well, another one of the things that stood out to me is Mami Abu Jamal talking about the origins of American policing. And I've read a, a couple of books that I would recommend to people, and I've, I've probably have recommended through other episodes of this podcast. But The End of Policing by Alex Vitale and Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police by Radley Balco and Locking Up, not Locking Up Our Own, uh, even though Locking Up Our Own is a good book, but it doesn't really pertain to this specific thing I'm trying to get to. And uh, Policing the Black Man by Angela why Davis, not Angela J. Davis. I think I'm getting that right. Uh, but 
I would recommend those three books because they all do a good job of of talking about the origins of policing. And I do agree with Mamiya Abu-Jamal that the origins of American policing uh, predominantly derived from slave patrols and the slave patrols that were in the South. He, he pointed to South Carolina specifically. But I do also believe that there are some origins, particularly in, in, in different regions of this country that aren't the South, uh, that have some type of that did take some type of uh, inspiration from the type of policing that was going on in in Britain, in Britain, the, you know, in the Britain, British policing. So, uh, but so I do think it's important to get to become informed both about the slave patrols that existed in America and how they influenced American policing, and also what policing looked like in Britain. In the, uh, I can't remember what they the names of them. They had a name for them. Uh, uh, bobbies, I think they call it bobbies or something like that. Uh, so those are the, those are all the, those are my main things that I take away from from this that specific passage that we just read. We have don't have much left in the book. I'm thinking the next episode should be our final episode. We had 26 minutes and 22 seconds. Man, nah, let's keep it under 30 because if I read another passage and then speak about it, we gonna go to like 40. So we gonna keep it under 30. I want you to. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to this. I want to ask you to please share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on. Uh, if you haven't listened to some of the previous episodes, please go back, listen to the previous episodes of The Social Construct of Leslie. And then I would also ask you if it's more episodes out now. I mean, Social Construct of Leslie. This is Rockford Reading Daily. Please go back to listen to the previous episodes of Rockford Reading Daily. However, if you have not also listened to The Social Construct of Leslie, please go listen to The Social Construct of Leslie podcast. Uh, listen to the Leader List by Ari Perez podcast that's on here. And also Live from Occupy City Hall podcast has some episodes out. So please go and listen to those. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, like us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, and again, we put these out so that way every day somebody can have the opportunity to begin on their journey to struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. And to also present people the opportunity every day to continue on their journey to struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. All right. We outside, y'all.